Hello and a very warm welcome to a brand new edition of To The Point with me, Frank Pereira on Rajas Sabha Television. Children are our future and we need to do everything that we possibly can to guide, nurture and protect them. They have this incredible knack of putting a smile on each and every one of our faces. But the problem really is millions of them continue to suffer on a daily basis. They live in poverty. They live in abysmal conditions and they are taken care of. They are taken advantage of, uh, you know, every now and then. And uh, to talk about what's being done to safeguard the interests of these little children, I have with me the CEO of Save the Children International, Hella Honing Schmidt. Thank you so much for joining me on the thanks program. For, thanks for inviting me. Thank you. And uh, she is also the former Prime Minister of Denmark. So that's something that we'll be talking about yes. in the next 20 minutes as well. Firstly, what brings you to India and why are you here this time? Well, basically, I've taken over as CEO of Save the Children International uh, only three weeks ago. Uh, and also we're launching this uh, big campaign, uh, which is called Every Last Child, basically mean that we want to reach the most marginalized children in the world. Uh, and the best place to start that campaign and to start doing that is uh, in the youngest nation uh, of the world, the nation that hosts most children. Uh, this is India. And that is why it was very natural for me to, to come to India to launch the campaign. And as the first country uh, I visited uh, as a, uh, one of our member organizations. So this was very important to me. Uh, children, uh, children are very close to my heart. And India is very close to my heart. I traveled here 30 years ago. Uh, so this is very natural for me to come to children and discuss with, with ministers uh, and everyone else here how we can help the most marginalized children. And what is the response that you've been getting thus far, you know? I, I must say a very good response. I've had the chance, uh, we, when we launched it, uh, we, had, we were very fortunate that the Minister of Urban uh, Development came to our launch. He was very positive about the, wor uh, the work. I just came from a, a meeting with the Minister for, for Children and Women, uh, and she was also very positive about what we could do together. Because what we are trying to do is work with the government. Mm. Uh, Save mm. the Children mm. has been in India for, I think, almost 80 years. Yes. We are a known entity here, and we want to work with the government to reach the most marginalized children. Uh, and as you know, the UN has adopted these sustainable development goals, where we have promised the children of this world that we will leave no one behind. Yes. And this campaign that we are now launching, that is our bid, our promise to these children of how we will reach every last children. And what is it about? Well, it's about uh, girls who are discriminated against. They have a smaller chance than other children of reaching their potential. It's about street children. It's about children that are uh, fleeing because, they, because of war or because of natural disaster. It's about disabled children that have a very high chance of not making it and reaching their potential. So this is about focusing in not just on poverty, but also asking what are the other barriers for children not to not be marginalized. And those barriers, we know very well that they are discrimination. You know, let's broaden the spectrum a little bit and yeah. talk about children suffering in, you know, war-torn countries, be it uh, Syria or some, several of the other, yes. you know, Middle Eastern countries where children are subjected to insane or, uh, you know, inhuman uh, cr cruelties on a daily yes. basis. So what's being done to protect these children? Well, our basic ask for all children all over the world, whatever their situation is, that we want them to get three things. It's mm. very simple. We want them to get them the right to survive. We want children to be able to survive their first five years much, in a, much better than they do now. We want to give them the chance to learn and not only go to school, but also have access to quality education. And the third thing is we want them to be protected. And wherever, wherever we work for children, be it in India, be it in, uh, in, in Syria or whatever, these are the three things we want to uh, achieve, a chance to survive, learn and be protected. And this is what we are asking uh, every government and every, all, all part of the community all over the world, let us help to help uh, these children. Interesting that you brought up education because I know education is very close to your heart. Yes, and is. when you were the Prime Minister of Denmark, you did speak about education and how every child needs to be educated to ensure that they come out of poverty. So would you say that education is one of the key or the most important things that a child should get? I mean, first of all, they have to survive. Uh, we know that every day 16,000 children die of diseases that in rich countries they don't even remember the names of anymore. This is how, how the situation is right now in our world. 16,000 children, we can prevent that. Then they also have to have a chance. They have the chance to learn. They have to, a, a chance to go to school. 
So our basic want is that every child on this planet have the right and the chance to go to school. And also that we don't see this discrimination where girls, a lot of girls get into primary education. That's the case in India as well. Yes, but yes. a lot of girls don't get into secondary education because they get married too early or something happens to them because they work or whatever. And this is what we want to do as well. We want to send every child into, first of all, primary education, but also champion that every, right, every, uh, every child should have the right to get into secondary education and also put quality into that education. We have 250 million, peop uh, million children in the world that goes to school but don't actually learn anything when they are in school. And this is one of the courses we are fighting for with the governments of the world, including the Indian government, to make these children not only go to school but learn when they're in school. You know, something that appalls me is the fact that uh, several children, girls especially, are pushed into the flesh trade and that's a major problem yes. worldwide, you know. Yes. Even some of the developed countries are facing this problem yes. where young girls are pushed into the flesh trade. So how are you addressing that problem? Because that is a massive problem. This is a problem and this is a problem all over the, the world. And we have to, first of all, tell the families what is going on. Tell families that, that perhaps think that their girls are going off to work in, in normal jobs in the bigger cities, what is actually happening? If a stranger comes into a village and say, oh, we can get your, uh, your uh, girls to have a job somewhere, we have to tackle that. And just yesterday, I went to Bihar, to mm. a very rural area, uh, very poor as well. I spoke to some of the girls there. I spoke to, a, in a small village, I spoke to a group of girls, 14 to 18 years old. Primarily, I talked talk to them about child marriage because mm. they are mm. very, very much against child marriage and they will do everything they can. And these are not very educated girls. These are girls just from the village. They want to do everything they can to protect other girls uh, from child marriage. And they also know that if someone comes from outside, I mean, they had drawings on the wall showing this, if someone comes from outside and try to l lure mm. their parents uh, into selling their girls mm. or mm. Uh, getting them into towns, they have to be vigilant and they have to understand that this is not always a good thing. And most often than not, it's a very bad thing. Indeed, it is a very bad thing. And, you know, there are several challenges, you know, dealing with children on a daily basis. It's not something that, that you know, you can deal with very easily. And then, you know, their minds are so innocent and yeah. you really need to nurture them and bring them up the right way. So what happens when you get these children and, you know, how, how do you actually ensure that they live uh, a, a better life? I think you have to, to make every child understand that they are a person in themselves, which means that they have rights in themselves. We have actually been very clever many years ago as a global community where we have adopted co conventions and legislation that should give every child their rights. So this is what every child needs to know, they have rights. And that means that every child has the right to survive and learn and be protected. And what, some of the things we're working with in, in this country is protecting uh, individuals, protecting children from all the bad things that can happen to them. We have a big project here on, on street children. These are children that don't even have a name. Like I met this young man the other day. He was, I think he was 16, Salman. He had been a street child himself. And he said to us, these children don't even have a name. We want to help the Indian government. I know the Indian government is very concerned about this as well. We want to help as much as we can to give these children a name, an identity. Because what happens if you don't have an identity? That means you don't have access to normal services like health and education. Uh, so our aim is over the next years to have 500,000 children in India registered uh, as legal citizens of this, this country. And if we do that well, that's my... Now, if we do that well, we can bring that knowledge to the rest of the world and, and, and be part of changing real lives for real children. You know, this is one of the campaigns that you're running here yes. in India. But what are some of the other big campaigns that Save the Children International is really running? Well, we have this, this big campaign that is an, a global campaign, which is basically to focus in on the discrimination that, is, that a lot of children are faced with. They're not, as I said before, they're not only faced with poverty, yes. they're faced with discrimination. And that goes for every children. And some of the things we want to put focus on in the next uh, few months and years are refugee children, 
Refugee children, they ha have a very difficult situation, but we want to campaign and focus in on they should not be out of school for more than one month. Even though you live in a refugee camp, you can go to school, and we want to ensure that. And the other thing is uh, child marriages. We know that if we could tackle, if we imagine a world where we could tackle child marriages, we could create a, sit a situation where each young woman, each girl, could decide over her own body. She has much more negotiating power within the family to decide how many children she wants to have. And therefore the rights also increase. The rights also increase and also her children. If a girl gets married later, later when she is actually a woman, she will have healthier children. They'll be more likely to go to not to survive and to go to school. So one of the issues we want to tackle is, is child marriages, which is far too prevalent all over the world in India, I'm afraid to say as well. So this is, and that is, that will create good in terms of health, education, and also protection of all these children. So if you had to list out three of your top short-term goals and the three long-term goals, what would they be? Well, first of all, we want to have a world. It's very simple. We want to create a world where we give every, right, like, every child the right to survive, to learn, and to be protected. We can't do that in one big mouthful. We have to take smaller steps. Baby steps. Yeah, we don't want to take baby steps. We want to take big steps because okay. we owe this to the world's children. So we want to take big steps. It's quite complex because you have to tackle child marriages. You have to tackle health issues for those, uh, those children. So it's quite a complex issue, but it's not more complex than we can take those steps and we will achieve our goal. This thing about protecting children, we have to understand that it's not something that they can't wait, but it's also something that can be done. We have half poverty within the last uh, 10 years. It's quite remarkable how far we have come in the world. I mean, we have never seen a world where children are healthier or wealthier or better educated than they are right now in history. And that is because people have decided this is how it's going to be. So I'm asking the world now, is there anything that should stop us for, from taking the next steps and reaching the most marginalized children and get them, give them the chances, the opportunities that they deserve. Nothing should stop us and we can do it. That's uh, your question to the world. My question to you is, you know, what do you believe are, is going to be your biggest challenge in achieving that goal? I think there'll be a number of challenges and we have an economic, there's always an economic challenge uh, that, that we don't have enough um, equitable, enough financing to help all children. I mean, I want a world where all children have access to quality education that they don't have to, to pay too much for. Uh, and this is, that's, we need financing and we need each country, particularly countries that are becoming middle uh, income countries, to also look at how will they finance all these things. So that's one obstacle. The other obstacle is legislation. We need to abolish all legislation that that creates discrimination because there still is legislation that, that creates discrimination. And also we have to make sure that where there are legislation that that actually gets followed, followed through uh, by uh, authorities. I mean, in this country we have legislation against uh, child marriage, Ch yes. but still there's, there's something to be done to follow it, it through. So legislation has to, be, has to be there. But also we need to make sure that we change the way we, our conversation about this because Legislation can't change everything. We need to change the conversation into uh, states, into communities, into families about uh, changing these kind of ways that actually discriminate against uh, children. And the last thing uh, that is an obstacle is accountability. These children need a voice. They need to be counted. I mean, literally counted. And if you are a street child, you don't even appear in any statistics. Yes. So they need to be accounted and we need to document how children live all over the world. And also we need to give them as individuals, as groups of children, a voice in decision making. So basically I would say financing, legislation, deep down, and uh, accountability, those are the three things that we are focused on. You know, those three things that you spoke about, let's talk about financing first. And, yeah. you know, uh, what are the kind of, let me understand, what are the kind of budgets you really have to work with on a yearly basis? Well, we have a, we have a big budget in Save the Children, and that's a mix of, of donors uh, helping, of, um, of contributions from, from companies and other. We have, so we have a big budget that we work with uh, on a daily basis across uh, the world. But I want to underline that it's not, save the children, we are a big 
uh, respected uh, organization, and we want to create real social impact. But we also understand that we cannot do this alone. And Indeed. that's why when I've been here, I've been taking the opportunity to meet ministers to actually appreciate to the Indian government the hard work they're trying to do. And I think the Indian government is trying to do that hard work and to signal very clearly to them that in a country like, like India, so vast, so complex, um, we are putting ourselves up as a partner uh, for the Indian government and we, want, we can't do it alone. We want to do it with the Indian government and everyone else who's interest, uh, interested in this are meeting uh, business, the business people in, in India, uh, people who have to, in the coming years, have to spend 2% of their uh, revenue on, uh, on, on uh, corporate social responsibility. And I want to talk to them about how can they help what Indeed. can they do? They can uh, help in a big way. They can help in a big way, but we have to be quite clever about how they help uh, and what, how they do things. So my main message is basically that we will do everything we can. And we have made a promise to the world's children, but we cannot do it alone. I need business. I need individuals. Uh, we need governments to help us do this. And we also need families uh, to be part of this change. Okay. And talking about legislation now, yeah. you know, in India, child labor is, uh, it, it's not, it's not uh, you know, allowed. You cannot mm. be working unless you're 16 or 18 years yes. of age. And so is the case with many other countries in the world as well. But in spite of that, there are several children under the age of 10 whom we see working in garages, working yes. in restaurants or hotels. You know, now that is a big problem. Now, how do you deal with a situation like that? Because, you know, that should come from the society as well, because the society or the person who's recruiting or hiring these children Absolutely. needs to understand that he shouldn't be doing it. Absolutely. And that's, again, an example of where you have the legislation, but it's not followed through for many, many different uh, reasons. I'm of the belief that this also has to be, an, that there ha of course, there's a moral argument for why children shouldn't be working, but it's also an economic argument. And that is that the best investment that any country can make, be it a very rich country, a middle income country or whatever, the best investment that any country can make is to invest in our children. Invest in their education. Uh, in, make sure that every child counts and that every child get a fair chance by, uh, by investing in education. If we invest in a girl getting not only to primary school but also to secondary school, we will make not only her and her family more wealthy, we will also make the nation more wealthy. So try not to keep, have children in, in labour and particularly not hazardous uh, uh, labour and put them to school instead and see if that is not a great investment for, for any country. Okay. And finally, of course, uh, accountability. You did mention about yeah. accountability. So as far as accountability is concerned, who's going to fix accountability? Isn't the onus on the governments to fix accountability? Yeah, the governments are, have, a main, have a huge responsibility here because they have to be, I mean, legislators have to be accountable to these communities. Uh, and that also means we have to figure out how they, what their situation is. There are a number of governments in this world that quite voluntarily don't actually get the statistics. They don't get the statistics of, of disabled or how many girls uh, are, are involved in education or how many children are registered at birth. Um, I went to Bihar yesterday and the, the, the number of children registered there at birth are far below the average of, of India. And that is a big problem because if you're not registered, you don't count um, and you don't have right to any, you don't have right to, rights to any, any services that are normal for everyone else. So we need to make sure that governments are accountable to these people and also for bringing the statistics in and for, for literally counting uh, uh, these, uh, these issues and also talking about it. One of the reasons why we are launching the campaign is to make sure that everyone understands that the problems we have in the world today is not only poverty. Because most children that are really marginalized, they are caught in a very poisonous cocktail of being poor, but also being systematically discriminated against because they are girls, because they are disabled, because they are street children, whatever. And this is what I want governments all over the world to realize, to talk about, uh, but not only that, also to make impact to tackle that. You know, we've spoken about Hela Thorning Schmidt in her new avatar, the social worker. But let's yeah. talk about uh, Hela Thorning Schmidt as uh, the former prime minister yeah. of Denmark. What really prompted you to make this switch? 
uh, you know, was it an automatic decision for you or was it something that you had to deeply consider? Well, I've been in politics for many years. I've been in and, in and around politics for, for more than 20 years. Um, and I've been leader of my party, the Social Democratic Party of, of Denmark, for more than 10 years, which is a very long time when you are leader of the party. And then I moved on to be, become prime minister. And I could easily have stayed as party leader. I could have stayed in, in Danish politics. And I appreciate all the work that we do in Danish politics uh, and also the international work that Danish governments have always uh, done. So I was, it wasn't like I was leaving and slamming the door and saying I don't want to have anything to do with politics. I believe that governments are important. Politicians do a hard work. They try to change things. But this was my opportunity to try and change things for a specific group of, of people that are very dear to me, children. These are, the ch these are the citizens of our world that live without a voice. Uh, if we don't give them a voice, so it was just too, it was too tempting for me not to do that, to try to give these children a, a voice, these citizens of the world a voice, and that's what I'm trying to do. Was it an easy switch to make from politics to a social worker? Uh, it's not an easy switch to make, but I believe that um, the mix that I have will, can make a difference. I believe that uh, the experience that I have gained in, in many years in politics, also as prime minister, uh, will be very helpful for me to, to understand the work we have to do on the ground, for example, in India. Because I understand where politicians are coming from. I understand that politics often is the art of the possible, uh, and that is very difficult. But, and I also understand, which I think is perhaps most important, that in order to really change things, to have the impact, social impact that we want to have for children. You cannot do it alone. We have to partner up with governments. You have to really talk to governments to understand where they're coming from and where we can fit in to their ideas and to their projects to try to change things on the ground. So I think that combination could actually be very useful um, for the group that I'm fighting for, and that is the children of this world. You know, uh, in 2015, when your party lost the elections, mm. you took uh, responsibility for the loss and you resigned immediately after yeah, that. Yeah, I'd like to say uh, we didn't actually lose the election in that way because we became the biggest party. You became party. the biggest party. We had a very good election result. But your uh, alliance did not our, have numbers. Our coalition collapsed yes. a little bit, so it wasn't possible to form a majority. But we did very well, and my party did, uh, did, did very well, and I was very happy with that. I mean, I was a leader for 10 years, and I was glad to hand over a party uh, that was uh, better off and in a better position. It's, I was quite proud of the fact that uh, every fourth, actually more, every fourth Dane decided to vote for, for my party. Uh, and that was a good result. But it also, for me, was the time to leave politics and do something completely different. Are, are, you, are you happy with where Denmark is right now politically? I mean, it's not my government uh, in, in Denmark, but I'm very, very proud of my country. I always will be. And I think Denmark is a country that takes big responsibility in the world. Uh, we are one of the countries that actually tries to live up to the UN recommendation of how, uh, how much money we should give to poorer countries. Um, we are a country that takes big responsibility in the world in terms of our uh, climate change, in terms of children, education, uh, development uh, in general. So even though it's not my government that sits there now, I think they still do uh, good international work. And one final question before I let you go, because I know you have a hectic schedule. Yeah. I'm going to end on a lighter note and yes. talk about the selfie in 2013 yes. with yeah. Barack Obama. You would like to see it, <laughs> wouldn't you? <laughs> I certainly would. So, uh, so what was the thinking behind it? You know, it was, um, it was an interesting day. We were in South Africa. It, was, it wasn't Mandela's funeral because it was, it was more like a big gay, uh, gathering. It in was a, in a somber a, occasion. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it was a somber occasion and not because the South Africans, they like a party. And it was like in a football stadium. So but there was a lot of, there was a lively atmosphere in the stadium. And we were just sitting um, on the benches. And basically, for some reasons, I happened to sit next to President Obama. And uh, people just came, kept coming up to Obama and having pictures taken and, and everything. So I just thought, well, I'm just going to sit down. I'm just going to snap a, a picture of us two. And I sat next to David Cameron. He was on the other side. So we just took a picture. It was very innocent uh, and a lot of fun. Um, so it was spontaneous then? It was completely spontaneous. And they thought it was fun. It was very fun. And it wasn't, I want to say that it wasn't in any way a, a contradiction to the situation we were in because it was a very it was of course a very serious uh, occasion 
but there was a very light atmosphere in that stadium, and uh, I wasn't the first person who, take, who, who took a picture, and it was just fun. Okay, so I'll have to call it a wrap on this edition of To The yeah. Point. It was a pleasure having you on the program. Thank and you for I having me. I appreciate you spending time with us here on Rajya Sabha yeah. Television. Thank, Thank you, you for so having much. me. And that's all the time we have on this edition of To The Point. Uh, see you again next time.